Welcome, Royal Family. It is July 14th, year of our Lord, 2023. And yes, we are filming out of my kitchen slash living room. We have some Royal Family members here. Uh, James and Lisa have arrived from Louisiana. They're sitting on the couch comfortably. And um, if they need to get up and have snacks, my wife, as you many of you know, is very efficient. The snacks are everywhere. Everything is set up. <laughs> We're set up for success, so we're going to jump right into it. I don't have a lot of prayers. What I think I'm going to do is keep Lisa and James in prayer. They're doing a lot of traveling, uh, visiting family, so we want to keep them in prayer. They're going to be traveling around. They're here gracing us with their presence. They're very uh, loyal followers and supporters of the ministry, so I think we're going to throw a special prayer out for them today. I don't have a lot else to announce let us jump into it. We are in 1 Thessalonians 109. It is 7, 14, 23 is your date. Your title is never attack God's choice of authority. Never attack God's choice of authority. So we are going to do the most important thing we do, which is what? To get into the Word, because in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw His glory Glory is the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. And like newborn babes, long for that pure milk of the word, so that by it you may grow in respect to your salvation. In order to grow up, you have to take in the word of God. So let us prepare to take in the word of God filled with the Holy Spirit. You want to open up that new nature. We call it the Christ-like nature. That is one of the terms that I coin often. The Christ-like nature is opened up by the filling power of the Spirit. Believers, naming and citing any known sins, washing that sin from your life. 1 John 1, 8, 9, and 10. Believers, if we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves. The truth is not in us. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins, cleansing us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, 10 says, Believers, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar. His word is not in us. Take a moment of silent prayer right now. Name and cite any known sins first and foremost. Get rid of the distractions and garbage around your periphery so you can focus on the Word of God and let us prepare to do the most important thing we do. Every head is bowed. Every eye is closed. And dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time we have to come and study your word. And Father, we're grateful to have royal family members here visiting us. And Father, we're just asking to lift them up in prayer. We're asking that their travel, they have traveling mercies. Keep their, your hand on them, their travels, their family. And Father, all the believers out there that are supporting this ministry, I'm just asking that wall of fire just keep burning strong around them, that protection. I'm asking for their spiritual growth to just forge forward no matter what's going on in this world. And we know there's a lot going on in this lost and dying world. Father, we're praying each and every day that this lost and dying world receive your word. Come to know you, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, Father. And we're asking all these things in his precious name, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Let me get my bearings about me. So if I'm a little off or you hear tiger making noises, relax and go with it. We are moving forward in the word. 1 Thessalonians lesson 109, never attack God's choice of authority. We are currently in a short series related to negativity and destruction of the chain of command. I was just talking to James and Lisa about that. I'm feeling led in that direction. That's where last message went. That's where this one went. And the next one, we might stay in this series. This was brought out by the principles we noted in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Actually, 1 Thessalonians 5, 2, and 3 started leading me in this direction. I could feel God, the Holy Spirit, leading me. This was brought on by these principles right here. 1 Thessalonians 5, 2. Apostle Paul writing, For you yourselves know full well, he's already telling them at Thessalonica, you've been taught these things. This is knowledge you should have absorbed already. It should eventually be turning into wisdom. Yourself know full well that the day of the Lord is coming, just like a thief in the night. Verse 3. While they are saying peace and safety, then sudden destruction will come upon them like labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. As I told you, this actually has 
uh, dual meanings in it. It is speaking about the rapture. From verse 1 into verse 5, the Apostle Paul is speaking about the end of the church age and the rapture of the church. But there is a reflection in this towards the end of the seven-year tribulation as well. The Apostle Paul is in the process of beginning a correction of false doctrine that was allowed into the congregation. Very big issue. This was because, just, at the church, just like at the church at Corinth, we covered last lesson, we noted last lesson, a few of the elders or those in leadership allowed the false teachers access in. Someone has to allow that stuff in. Either through a counterfeit message or a teacher that now began to spread lies in that congregation, Cor Corinth and Thessalonica had this problem. It wasn't the only church, as I told you already. The Gnostics and the Pharisees were following Paul around often. Paul had established that church inside of about two months on his first visit to Greece. It was about five weeks, it's believed, he taught there, and then Timothy circled back around and came back in and taught and checked up on them. So Paul established that church inside of about two months, gave them a lot of uh, doctrine. He then had Timothy, Pastor Timothy, circle back around and come to Thessalonica to teach the repetition and to check on their progress. Now, they were taught about the seven years of tribulation, the rapture, as well as the second advent of Christ. It wasn't something new. They were taught these things, not only by Paul, but also Timothy, repeating the doctrines over again. That is why Paul emphasizes knowing full well, the way he originally says that, is you guys already have this knowledge. It's not to belittle them. It's to let them know we've covered this before. It's almost as if you're training somebody at work and you've gone over a principle of the job three or four times and then they're still failing in that area and you're like, what part of it aren't you getting? That's why Paul is emphasizing knowing full well about the doctrines of eschatology. Even if you don't know all the deeper principles, you know how the steps are going to fall in the end times. Yet Timothy had to report back to the Apostle Paul that some of the members were now going in a different direction. They were, they've, either, they've either lost the teaching or they've rejected the teaching. This was because they slowly began to erode the chain of command that was left for them. I'm going to show you something today about chain of command a lot of people don't realize. This was because they slowly began to erode the chain of command that was left for them. There are actually important principles, protocols, concerning a chain of command that should be highlighted and a lot of people might not understand this unless you've served in the military or been in a corporation that really understands a military terminology and chain of command. A chain of command is that which is set by an authority, obviously. The authority can be a governing body, meaning a bunch of people that vote on these things, or it can be one authority, depending on what we're talking about. A chain of command is that which is set by an authority, a governing body, or one authority. It is the guidelines, regulations for training, etiquette, daily functions, procedures, and the line of command under the initial authority. A lot of people immediately jump to the line of command under the authority when they hear chain of command. Nothing wrong with that. That's a basic concept. There's a lot more that goes to it. For a ministry, church, whatever you'd like to call it, it is the pastor who sets the chain of command, yet... His authority to do so answers to Bible doctrine and nothing else. Bible doctrine is what should be guiding, obviously, the filling power of the Spirit in the Word, but it's Bible doctrine that's guiding the standards, the etiquette, the regulations, the training, the functions, procedures, all of those things, nothing else. Not something that uh, somebody brings into the ministry and says, well, I feel this and this insulted that and I feel that's too hard and the world says this and this should be run this way. It, if it doesn't align with the Bible doctrine, God's word, it cannot guide that pastor or that leader in the church. The ultimate authority is the word. The ultimate authority is the word of God. Every pastor is accountable to that, period. Every pastor is accountable to that. Not the emotions of the congregation. There's no way. It doesn't matter if it's a, a ministry online like this or a brick and mortar church building. It doesn't matter. Congregation members, when you look at them, whether it's, it's 10 people or 110 people that are involved in that ministry, 
Eventually, somebody out of that group is going to get their feelings hurt. Something's going to go astray. And they're going to want to come to the pastor or the leadership and say, well, this bothered me or that bothered me. You cannot worry about pleasing the people. You have to align it with Bible doctrine, the Word of God. Every pastor is accountable in that way, not the emotions of the congregation. Christ is the head of the church, just as he is the head of the family and the head over everything. King of kings, Lord of lords. Amen? Amen. Amen, James. There you go. <laughs> King of kings, Lord of lords. Every pastor has to adhere to the mind of Christ. What is the mind of Christ? That Bible you have in front of you. Every pastor has, has to adhere to the mind of Christ. They must run their ministry in a fashion that upholds Bible doctrine. I always use the term accurately because there's a big difference between somebody who is off, even slightly, and somebody who is accurate. Yet they may differ on minor details in their church or ministry. I'm going to show you what, that, what I mean by that. They may differ, listen to me carefully, they may differ on minor details in their church or ministry. And I'm going to show you what details they would, they would stray on a little bit or differ in. It's hard to get comfortable here. I haven't done this one on this angle in a while. Some pastors may have a protocol of the time of service. That's up to them. Some pastors may have a manner of preference for those under their, their authority. Meaning, I like this for a deacon. I like this for a prep school teacher. So some pastors may have a protocol of the time of service. Manner of preference for those under authority. Number allowed in leadership in their ministry. That's up to the pastor as well. Style of church or ministry foundational principles. Foundational principles, etc. I have on there. There's several things. I think you're understanding what I'm saying. As long as it does not, underline that one, I should have. As long as it does not contradict the word of God, the pastor is the final authority. As long as... As it does not contradict the word of God, the pastor is the final authority. Now, the word of God tells you that there is always a leader, but that leader has to respect and love those under his leadership. That's the chain of command. So if your pastor's a tyrant, he's not following the word of God. So as long as it does not contradict the word of God, the pastor is the final authority. A chain of command is covered in all those aspects, as well as those in leadership under the pastor. What's the matter, boo-boo? Tiger's getting grumpy over there. He didn't get a walk this morning. It's too hot. <laughs> I'll wait till tonight. <laughs> wait till the sun goes down a little. We wait till like 7, 30, 8 o'clock. I was just telling James and Lisa, we're breaking records here in Florida. This part of central Florida is, I think, 30 years. Was uh, one of the uh, weather men came on the station the other day and say, we're breaking heat records here for the last 30 years. Now, so the chain of command is a general term. That's what I'm telling you. You need to understand that. The chain of command is a general term, even within the military, to mean slightly more than just who's next in line in leadership. Slightly more than just who's the next leader or who is the line under the authority. Business owners, fathers and mothers should pay attention to this concept as well. The government should as well. Amen. Business owners, fathers and mothers should pay attention to this concept as well. For example... I have to use examples I know that I can relate to you. In the Army, you always had a handbook. I don't care what you did in the Army, and I'm sure I got friends in the Marines, and I had an uncle that 20-something years in the Air Force. You always have handbooks and guidebooks. You had a field guide. Yet there were also what they would call drill and ceremony guide, um, soldier's guide, techniques of military instructions. Every, everywhere you went, there was manuals and books. Depending on your MOS, your job title, you would have to know certain things. These were all part of the chain of command. They were all part of the chain of command under the general concept of authority is what I'm telling you. They were all part of the chain of command under the general concept of authority. If you drove a five-ton truck, there was an army guidebook for that specific truck. So you could turn to page 12 and it would be listed, you know, A357 or whatever, uh, front wheel. And you'd have to see how the front wheel operates and how to take it off. If you drove a five-ton, it didn't matter what you did. Everything had a guidebook, specific guidebook. Every soldier 
became responsible to have access to that book and follow the protocol in that book. And I made a note for myself because I have a, a funny story I'd like to tell you. The Army Field Manual. I remember being out on bivouac in the, in the woods one time. I think we were in uh, Army Military Police Academy after basic training. And we were out in the woods for about two or three weeks. And in your Army, your, your Field Soldier's Manual... It even teaches you how to dig trenches around your tent and all these kind of different... Every little simple thing is in there. And back in the day, in like 1980, when we were training, you had a, a female side of the tent. The other guy had a male side of the tent. I think this is an adult channel. You all know what I mean. There was a button and a hole that went in. So I'll leave it at that. So that was what you had. Maybe three feet long and six feet wide. You had to set your tent up like that, stretch it out. But you also had to dig a trench. And if you ignored doing that, what you would find out, and we found out many times, some people have found out anyway, when it rained, you would have a very wet night if you didn't have a trench dug the right way around your tent. Amen, James? Amen. Okay. <laughs> Something simple like that is part of the chain of command. That was in your book. Take your entrenching tool and dig it the right way. I know it sounds goofy, but I'm telling you, there's a lot of details there. Every soldier became responsible to have access to that book and follow the protocol in that book. If you screwed up, <laughs> oftentimes, if you screwed up, the first thing those in leadership would ask you was, why didn't you follow the protocol in the manual? That was the first thing they would ask you. What's your manual say? Why didn't you follow that? Well, I, I was going to ask you, but you were busy and you, know, you weren't here. I didn't know. What's your manual say? You have a training. That's part of your chain of command. If you did follow the protocol, you either wouldn't screw it up in the first place or it probably wasn't your fault. Something or someone else caused the error is what I'm telling you. If you followed that book, I know it sounds goofy, but if you follow that book to the letter and doing that task to the letter and follow that instruction, you knew that section of the book for that instruction and something went wrong, I can almost guarantee you it was something else. It wasn't your fault, which was good because you could be like, I followed it to the letter. I know I did my part. So it's, under, it's important to understand that aspect of the chain of command. Authority is only destroyed after the chain of command is eroded, is what I'm telling you. So if you understand these principles and you see something eroding, falling apart a little bit at a time, you better address it right away. Authority is only destroyed after the chain of command is eroded. This means that protocols and those in charge of regulations and protocols failed, period. In the case of Thessalonica, those left with the messages from the Apostle Paul neglected their duties, period. No excuses. The secondary failure was following a false or negative message or teacher to allowing that to really enter the congregation. So you had two areas of failure you could look at in the chain of command. One was somebody, whether it was one or two elders or a leader, or whoever it was, didn't continue to the repetition the right way, the way Paul and then Timothy, right behind Paul, left it. The secondary failure was false doctrine, negativity, negative messages or teachers entering that congregation. Somebody needed to stand strong and say, uh-uh, you either need to sit down and shut up because we have a pastor or apostle here or you need to leave. Not bring that negativity and false doctrine in. As a leader, folks, everybody's a leader in their own little world. As a leader, make your policies and guidelines clear. Do not stray from them. Do not stray from them because that brings confusion eventually weakness in the chain of command, period. Criticism will always pop up. Get used to it. Criticism will always pop up from time to time, but constant criticism is a problem. That's negativity. The difference between occasional criticism popping up, somebody saying, I, I don't kind of like the way this is going, I, I have a question about that, or I don't like the way this was done, and bringing it up in the right fashion, that's going to happen occasionally, no big deal. That's a good thing. So criticism will pop up from time to time, but constant criticism is a problem. That is a negativity in the atmosphere that is cancerous. I learned that from Pastor Bob. 
when he was teaching me about leadership in the church. You can't just turn a blind eye and say that'll fix itself. It turns cancerous. Constant criticism, negativity of anyone deteriorates the relationship. I don't care if it's friendship, husband and wife, congregation and pastor, whoever it is. Constant criticism, negativity in the atmosphere of anyone deteriorates the relationship. It also can chip away at the confidence of someone who may have areas of weakness, even if they seem strong. You continually chopping at an area. That strong person, like everybody else, has faults and failures. They're going to look at themselves and say, well, maybe I'm not up for this, or maybe I'm really failing badly because of this constant chopping. Constant, consistent criticism of the pastor destroys his authority. He should be strong enough to stand in his gift and not collapse in weakness, so he's got to be able to handle the situation, yet consistent criticism becomes a slow, repeated injection of poison that weakens the chain of command of that pastor, period. Slow, consistent injection. That's what it is. When I'm talking regular negativity, sins of the tongue, constantly circulating around, Yet consistent criticism becomes a slow, repeated injection of poison that weakens the chain of command of that pastor. All the things leading up to that authority. Think of that when you think of chain of command. All the things leading up to that authority. All the things are not only leaders, they're protocols, regulations, etiquette. It's a chain that goes all the way up to the authority. You want to see that chain break apart? Leave that negativity in the atmosphere for a long period of time. That will erode eventually all the way up to the authority. Trust me when I tell you, whether it's marriage, government, business, church, whatever it is. Allowing consistent negativity in and around the chain of command deteriorates the authority. Does it happen overnight? No. Period of time. Loss of authority neutralizes any effect of the communication of Bible doctrine. Loss of authority neutralizes any effect of the communication of Bible doctrine. Divine viewpoint is essentially stopped eventually. No communication of Bible doctrine, folks, means what? No soul breathing. Inhale, exhale. No soul breathing will eventually lead to what? Hardness. Scar tissue of the soul. We've covered these principles before. Many of you are well-schooled. Scar tissue in the soul means no spiritual growth or function inside the plan of God, which in turn means what? Thinking and walking lifestyle with human viewpoint. I'll read it again. I want you to absorb this because, as I always say, this is the simple math of the situation we're looking at. This is the simple math of the situation we're looking at today. No communication of Bible doctrine because you've destroyed the chain of command means no soul breathing. No soul breathing will eventually lead to hardness and scar tissue of the soul. Scar tissue in the soul means no spiritual growth or function inside the plan of God, which in turn, simple math, means eventually thinking and walking lifestyle with human viewpoint. Human viewpoint means what? Disorientation. Human viewpoint, if you're thinking and walking, lifestyle I'm talking. Human viewpoint means disorientation to the plan of God and really the grace of God as well. Anything you knew about grace in your life or operated in starts to go out the window. Remember what we looked at in the last lesson in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. I'll put it on the board. 2 Corinthians 10, 9. There was an effort to undermine the teaching and the authority of the Apostle Paul. There was a concerted effort by outside forces, and then a handful of arrogant, emotional believers inside took and ran with that. 2 Corinthians 10, 9. Apostle Paul writes, Then I may not seem as if I would terrify you. He's using the words that we used against him. Terrify you by letters. Verse 10, For they say his letters are weighty and strong, but his personal presence is unimpressive, and his speech contemptible. These were direct quotes, as I told you last lesson, from Paul's critics. These were direct quotes that were allowed inside the church, inside the congregation. 
And then what happened was a few of them took off running with that. So once you allowed it in, you have one or two that were there. Now they're saying, yeah, I kind of agree with that new doctrine, that new teacher, this new message coming in. So Paul is actually quoting his critics here. Now the two Greek words that are used here have a negative, very strong actually, negative connotation towards the Apostle Paul. We'll take a look at him. Arrogant people are usually insecure under the surface of their confidence. Arrogant people, people that really, we all have arrogance in us, but I'm talking people that are really narcissistic and arrogant. They are usually insecure under the surface, though oftentimes they come across very puffed up in confidence. They have a tendency to use words and phrases in a very manipulative manner to try and plant seeds in other people. Because what? Misery loves company. Well, so does arrogance oftentimes. Remember, rebellious arrogance, think about Satan. He took a, the third of the angels, went with him. Actually, as I teach and Pastor Bob and even Colonel Thien mentioned one time, all the angels probably fell. Lesson for another day. Remember, rebellious arrogance loves company. They enjoy building alliances with others to appear stronger and more righteous. So those two words you're looking at, actually, weighty and strong, the two Greek words are barus and iskuras. Some funky words there, weighty, barus, heavy, severe or grievous in nature. Like somebody drops some really heavy news on you you can't handle it brings you really down to the ground. Overwhelming or too much of a load to carry. And the other word you're looking at there, strong, is really iskuras. Iskuras means very strong. Not just I'm feeling kind of strong today. You're very, this is a person that's very strong. It actually means forcible. Having overpowering might. Kind of like, uh, you know, Hulk Hogan kind of power, right? Amen. These were used to point out that the Apostle Paul pushed too much upon the congregation. His letters were too much. Too much to carry, too much to digest. It's way too much. It's overpowering. It's almost rude. It's forcible. That's what these meant. So you have to look at what they mean in our world today, Year of Our Lord 2023, and what they might mean 2,000 years ago, certainly in this uh, Koine Greek. Barus, it is taken from a root word meaning very burdensome. Don't just mean, wow, that's heavy, brother. That really, that's, that's a lot you gave me. That's really good. It's heavy, but it's good. It's a negative one. Taken from a root word meaning very burdensome, too heavy to carry. Can't do it. It's kuras, the other one, strong, means strong, but it is also used for overpowering, violent, one of the definitions. Forcible and violent, overpowering. Human viewpoint, folks, human viewpoint attacks or distorts doctrine. Welcome to the world we live in. In fact, the emotional attack is usually centered upon Bible doctrine being too difficult to understand. Ever heard that? I don't like that message. It's too, you got to really sit down and pay attention. I don't feel good with it. Bible doctrine is too difficult to understand. Bible doctrine, when it goes deep, is unloving. That's what they're saying. If you go too deep with that Bible, it, it, that Bible thing, the doctrine thing, it's unloving. That's one of the claims from the emotional believers you usually get. These are the folks who usually say, these are very common sayings. Just read your Bible. Just read your Bible occasionally. Be nice to one another. Don't worry about all that studying and that deep principles. It's all just love. How many of you heard that? It's all just love. You don't need all that Bible doctrine study, that weighty, strong stuff like Paul did. You don't need all of that stuff. You see, human viewpoint, folks, always, human viewpoint always attacks the word, and the attack begins with just such subtle criticism as that or this you're seeing on the board. Attacks begin subtly, yet they almost always remain, almost always remain directed at communication of Bible doctrine, meaning the one communicating it comes under the assault. Within the teaching of 2 Corinthians was a few hard lessons we looked at. Though hard on them, I showed you, it was an expression 
of God's love and Paul's love and concern for those infected by negativity in the atmosphere. That's love. When you give a little divine sarcasm and you shake and wake somebody. I know it doesn't seem like that in the world, but it is. To have sins and negativity exposed is beneficial. You don't learn that till you mature a little bit. To have sins and negativity exposed is beneficial. It helps believers correct themselves, adjust to the justice of God. Therefore, resulting in what? Rebound, we call it. And that combined with a steady intake of Bible doctrine is how the removal of scar tissue begins to happen in your life. You have to recognize it first. What's the old saying? You've got to take responsibility for your mistake. Nobody else. You have the one finger pointing out all the time and three fingers pointing back. Take a look at the three fingers pointing back. Adjust to that first. The consistent filling power of God the Holy Spirit and Bible doctrine will remove scar tissue over time, if you have a lot. The Apostle Paul is using his authority to lead carnal believers back into the grace plan of God. How is that not love? How is that not love? The Apostle Paul is using his authority to lead carnal believers back into the grace plan of God. I don't understand how that's not love. Discipline done the right way, when a parent disciplines a child the right way, is love. You guys can go over to the Old Testament, Numbers chapter 12. We're going to finish up today in Numbers chapter 12 and look at some principles related to exactly these things we just covered. Old Testament, Numbers chapter 12. All of the divine sarcasm and hard teaching was necessary for that church, for any of those churches. They're written for our benefit, folks. The chain of command is that what? Bible doctrine is accurately, I always use that word because that's the way I was taught. That's what the Bible teaches us. The chain of command is that Bible doctrine is accurately handled, upheld to the highest standard, first by what? The pastor, then those under his authority, and any of the etiquette, uh, uh, documents, Guidelines, regulations, all align with accurate Bible doctrine. Hebrews 13, 17 tells us what? Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls, really in reference to teachers and leaders in the church. Hebrews 13, 17, obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account so that they may do this with joy, not groaning, for this would be unhelpful for you, not them. For you, not them. It's difficult when you're dealing with somebody negative and all you get back from them is negativity. You find out there's negativity in them towards you and you're trying to teach them. Or they don't understand that sometimes it is about discipline or it is about shaking and waking people up. And they get insulted because they're being subjective and not objective. There is evidence in the Bible of the right man, right woman, as well as evidence of the right pastor, teacher in the Bible as well. There is evidence that our government leaders, federal and state, can be the right leaders chosen by God. There's all evidence in the Bible. Romans chapter 13 covers that principle. There's right man, right woman. The right time to do this, the right time to do that, the right pastor, teacher. There's evidence of that throughout the Bible. There's evidence that our government leaders, even federal and state, can be the right leaders chosen by God if we're going in the right direction. Romans chapter 13 covers some of that principle. Now, you guys should be in Numbers chapter 12. We're going to go right through, and we're going to close today in that chapter. So get comfortable in Numbers chapter 12. We're going to go right through it. I'm just going to do some commentary on it. Very important for this lesson we're in. In fact, when I had uh, James and Lisa turn to it, James was like, oh yeah. <laughs> he said, Miriam and Aaron. Numbers chapter 12 recalls a very good lesson on undermining the authority over you. Breaking down the protocol chain of command. The Exodus generation were a challenge for Moses. They challenged his authority many different times. But in this particular case... It was two family members, Aaron and, and Miriam. And many don't realize, but the, uh, the, the, um, 
I guess the root words that you look at in the Hebrew for Miriam is really what we use in the New Testament for Mary, and it has more of a title to it. It has more of a title to it than people realize. And Miriam was actually supposed to be in charge of kind of the ladies. She had a leadership role, not as a pastor. Don't get me started. But she had kind of a leadership role. So Numbers chapter 12 recalls a very good lesson in undermining the authority over you. The Exodus generation were a challenge for Moses' authority more than once. But in this particular case, it was two family members involved in a chain of command that bucked against Moses' authority. Numbers 12.1. Pick it up right there. Then Miriam, just so you know, not picking on the ladies, how this is written in the original Hebrew points to the fact that Miriam was what we call the ringleader here. Then Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Cushite woman who he had married, for he had married a Cushite woman. Now, you can look at different scholars and different historians. Most, not all, most will agree that this was Moses' second wife. The original Hebrew text insinuates here that Miriam, the way it's written, began the rebellion with Aaron, the sad little puppy, following the sister behind him, following her lead. This was Moses' second wife they're talking about who was probably from the African continent of Ethiopia. This is a recorded account of what we would call today an interracial marriage. So don't ask me any questions about it, because it's no big deal in the plan of God. Which shows us it means nothing concerning culture or skin color in the plan of God. Not about culture and skin color in the plan of God. You know what it's about? More importantly, being equally yoked. Believing the same things. Equally yoked means you believe the same things. You have many of the same norms and standards. That's more important than anything else. The only time you see God, because there's always going to be somebody, what about this time? What about that time? I can tell you if you peel the onion back far enough, the only time you see God warning against intercultural marriage has to do with what? False idols and foreign gods infecting his people. That's what he was concerned about. God always looks at the heart. Amen? Amen? Amen. He sees two races or two cultures, believer or unbeliever. I tell you that all the time. I know our political elite and media love the division because you know what division does? Satan's the king of this. Division causes confusion, anger, strife, all kinds of problems. And when there's confusion, anger, and strife, everybody's off balance. And when people are off balance and weak and angry, you can lead them. That's why our media and our political elite love dividing. Rich against poor, black against white, Democrat against Republican. All kinds of issues we could get into. I won't get on that today. <laughs> but God sees two races, two cultures, believer and unbeliever. That is it. So if you ask me any questions about interracial marriage, I just gave you your answers right there. Not that I've gotten any of those questions. I think most people with common sense, realize that. Numbers 12, 2. And they said, what? Is it a fact that the Lord has spoken only through you, Moses? He has spoken not just through us as well, he says. This is Miriam believed to be speaking. Is it a fact that the Lord has spoken only through you, Moses? Has he not spoken through us as well? And he had. And the Lord heard this. Numbers 12, 3. But notice this. Before you get into verse 4, notice why this is written. Now the man Moses was very humble more than any person who was on the face of the earth. Why is that written? The Bible is clearly stating Moses had tremendous humility even as the God-ordained leader. Moses was not going to call out his brother and sister and he needed to. He needed to. His humility was almost too much at that point. He should have stopped that in the bud, nipped it in the bud, as we say. He didn't. The Bible's clearly stating Moses had tremendous humility, even for the God-ordained leader. Moses was not going to call out his brother and sister, and he needed to. Aaron was second in command, no doubt. And Miriam was actually a leader of the ladies. She had a good quality about her, a good leadership skill, but you have to understand the chain of command. This was part of the chain of command for the Exodus generation. 
like it or not, this was part of the chain of command for the Exodus generation. Numbers 12, 4, on the board. And the Lord suddenly said to Moses and to Aaron and Miriam, you three, go out. You ever had dad do that? Everybody go out. Come over here. Call everybody out. Big daddy's coming in. <laughs> I'm a father. <laughs> you three go out to the tent of meeting. So the three of them went out. He's calling them on the carpet, all of them. There was not a mention here or a moment of hesitation is what I'm telling you. This happened like this. They said it, and then you see verse 3 just to remind you how humble Moses was, almost to a fault. He should have took control. And God came in like that. Not a moment of hesitation. Because God does not approve of hesitation in the realm of bucking authority in the chain of command, period. There was not a moment of hesitation here, how it's written. Because God does not approve of hesitation in the realm of bucking authority in the chain of command. The Hebrew verb pithom is there, not just suddenly. Pithom in the Hebrew. Instantaneously. So fast it'll make your head spin, I think my dad used to say. So fast it was surprising. Like shock. That's how that was. Pithom, suddenly, where it says suddenly said. It's the Hebrew adverb, actually. Pithom, not just suddenly, instantaneously. So fast it was shocking and surprising. Numbers 12, 5. Then the Lord came down in the pillar of the cloud and stood at the entrance of the tent. And he called Aaron and Miriam. When they had both come forward, Numbers 12, 6, look on the board. He said, now hear my words. Nonsense is over with. Now hear my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known to him in a vision. If you think you know what I want, let me let you know. I'll be clear. I use my word, my men, when I want. Not when you want, not what you think. Now hear my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known to him in a vision. I will speak to him in a dream. How it was done in the Old Testament, different dispensation. Right there's something for dispensations, if you doubt. Moses was the prophet and the leader. No questions asked. God spoke to Aaron and Miriam, absolutely, under different and more unique circumstances. Moses was the chosen leader, exclamation point. Moses was the chosen leader. So was Miriam or Aaron, I believe it was Miriam who said it, wrong by saying, well, you're not the only one God speaks to. No, of course not. But who's the chosen leader? What's the chain of command? How does that chain go up to the authority? God's saying, I'll make this clear. This is very uh, strong in how this is written. Just so you know, these three or four verses, the way God called them out and dealt with this immediately has a lot of strength, no nonsense in it, and you're going to see why. Numbers 12, 7. It is not this way for my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my household. Numbers 12, 8. With him I speak mouth to mouth, he says. In other words, I'm very personal with him. That's what it means. I give him more information than I give you because you're not the leader. That is openly and not using my mysterious language. In other words, the way I talk to you is way different than how I talk to Moses. And he beholds the form of the Lord. So why were you not afraid to speak, not respectful, not in awe? Why were you not afraid to speak against my servant, against Moses? What is God saying there? God was stating, you directly challenged my authority, not Moses. That's what he was saying. And I'm not trying to elevate myself or any other pastor. I'm just letting you know. You take this meal and digest it how you feel because you always have people buck against authority. God was stating clearly in these scriptures, you directly challenged my authority, not Moses. That's who you challenged. It's not about Moses, it's about me, God said. How, how would you feel if God said that to you? To me, when I really study this and tear this apart and look at it, let me tell you, it's very serious. Serious indictment. Numbers 12, 9. And the anger of the Lord burned against them, and he departed. This is no joke. Numbers 12, 10. 
But when the cloud had withdrawn from above the tent, behold, Miriam was leprous as white as snow. As Aaron turned toward Miriam, behold, she was leprous. Get a sense that God wasn't playing games? This happened very quickly. This is one of, this is one of those ones when you see the real bad kid and he does something and breaks the lamp in the neighbor's house, whatever it is, and the dad immediately grabs his arm and lays into him. Oh, yeah, that's biblical. I know it's not cosmic, but it's biblical. It happens so quick, the kid's like, oh, my gosh. And he's screaming and crying, and the dad sticks him in the other room and says, now, with your red bottom, sit in the other room and think about what you did. Like that. I can just tell you, and I can kind of chuckle. My dad wasn't good at a lot of parenting skills. But one thing he was good at, there was always one warning. That was it. When he said stop, <laughs> the next time you did it, you can assure there was going to be a strong grab on your arm and you were going to get lit up. So I'll give him credit for that. <laughs> That's what this is. I'm trying to explain it to you, break away the rubber meets the road. This is no nonsense. Take it with how you want to take it. Romans 12, on uh, Romans, Numbers 12, 11. Then Aaron said to Moses, oh my Lord, pay attention here. I beg you, do not hold us responsible for this sin. What is Aaron doing? He knows immediately by which we've turned out to be foolish, by which we have sinned. What do you do at the beginning of every message? You name and cite. I know I sinned. I got this, God. You're right, I'm wrong. Aaron quickly adjusted to the justice of God right there. The moment he looked, he was actually probably saying this as God the pillar of cloud was pulling away because he realized, wow, that was abrupt. Aaron quickly adjusted to the justice of God. Numbers 12, 12. Oh, do not let her be like a dead person whose flesh is half eaten. It's cancerous, leprous, form of skin cancer, whose flesh is half eaten away when he comes out of his mother's womb. Numbers 12, 13. So Moses, because Moses was a good leader, cried out to the Lord, saying, God, heal her, please, even though she's negative and has sins of the tongue against me. Numbers 12, 14, but the Lord said to Moses, if her father had only spit in her face, <laughs> if you know the ancient world, I'll explain this, would she not be put to shame for seven days? Have her shut outside the camp for seven days. This is God. This is God. And I want you to think about sometimes when, you, when something happens in your life and you don't adjust to God's plan and there's a ripple effect. The old rock in the placid lake, the ripples go on for a while. Have her shut outside the camp for seven days and afterward she may be received again. This was part of an ancient punishment for a rebellious daughter or son. When a father reprimanded them and then spit on the ground, you ever see anybody do that? Ever seen an old guy be so upset with his daughter or son and said, I'm done with you. That's what this is. This was because you have some old school, I think, Italians and probably um, different cultures that still do this. You get that old guy upset and the, the daughter is insulted the family or the son has insulted the family somehow. They'll spit on the ground next to him. That's where this comes from. This was part of an ancient punishment for a rebellious daughter or son. When a father reprimanded them, and then spit on the ground near them, that was bad enough. To spit in the face, this was extreme. To spit in the face carried with it an extended punishment. That was because the error was so grievous that the shame alone in the family would now become public shame. That that parent would say, now everybody can see this. You've gone that far, everybody's going to see this. Miriam became a spectacle for everybody. Why is God so mean? What did Miriam do? She knew the rules. She's part of the chain of command. She needed to take responsibility. Numbers 12, 15. So Miriam was shut out, side of the camp, seven days. Right there. So Miriam was shut outside the camp for seven days, and the people did not move on again until what? Miriam was received again, and she was healed again. There's something here, folks, that you need to pay attention to. Two principles. 
Sin carries with it responsibility, and God makes the choice of discipline. I don't know what to tell you. Sometimes it's you're quickly dealt with. Other times, because of something you need to learn, it goes on for a period of time. Sin carries with it responsibility. God makes the choice of discipline and the length of it. Question him. She was brought back in after seven days. God's perfection, usually, number seven, right? A perfect cycle. Perfection. His work is done. And you know what else is reflected in this? Eternal security. Eternal security. How quickly could have God just said, lightning bolt, she's done. He's God. He didn't. She paid the penalty. She dealt with her situation. I think she might have learned a lesson, I'm assuming. And she was brought back in because she's one of the believers. Eternal security was in view. Very interesting principles right there. Sin carries with it responsibility, and God makes the choice of discipline and length of time. What's going to happen? How it's going to be dealt with? She was brought back in after seven days, and I would say eternal security was in view, folks. Oftentimes, believers wonder how God's discipline works out. I can't give you all the answers. I can show you the Bible. Here's a great example. One thing I can tell you is, and I can almost guarantee it, that keeping short accounts with God's justice system <laughs> ensures you don't see any long-term discipline and that even a curse can be turned into a blessing. I would venture a guess from my personal studies and where God the Holy Spirit leads me, Miriam had a little problem with authority all along and Moses being the leader. Just my personal opinion. And yet, Miriam, even in the New Testament, Mary is a title for a woman in leadership. Not a pastor, just somebody that you can look up to that takes care of things. Oftentimes, believers wonder how God's discipline is all going to work out. One thing I can tell you, keeping short accounts with God's justice system ensures you don't see any long-term discipline and that even a curse can be turned into a blessing. I guess the old saying is never play games with the justice system of God. Amen. Bring yourself to his mercy quickly. Have your repentance in your heart after you sin. There's a thought of repentance in there. I know I failed. I acknowledge I failed. I adjust to the justice of God. Never play games with the justice system of God. Bring yourself to his mercy quickly and have repentance in your heart after you sin. And I can almost guarantee things will go a little smoother for you. Numbers 12, 16. Afterward, however, because she was brought in healthy again, a view to eternal security, the people moved on from Hazaroth and camped in the wilderness of Paran. God is always ready to move forward and not look backward at yesterday's failures. God Always ready, are you? Deal with the situation, look forward and move forward, forget it out, get it out and forget it out yesterday. Psalms 103, 12 and 13, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our wrongdoings from us, believers. Verse 13, just as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those whom Fear, respect, love him. Those who are in awe, many of you know that means that, hold the Lord in high regard. Those are the ones who know the protocol of the divine justice system. I think you all understand that. I'm assuming many of you are believers. I thank you for your time. I'm going to enjoy my fellowship and some food. I'm hungry. I know James and Lisa are probably hungry. Please keep them in prayer in their travels. Every head is bowed. Every eye is closed. Father, bless this message. Take it out to a lost and dying world. Through your son's precious name, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right. <laughs>